Hello, everybody. Um, it's my great honor and uh, great pleasure to introduce Professor Liso Fox. Liso is the Vice President, Semiconductor Strategy Director of Center for Semiconductor Manufacturing. She's also a professor at Electrical and Computer Engineering, uh, my colleague and my friend. Uh, Professor Liso Fox is the moderator of this panel. Um, challenges and opportunities in semiconductor workforce development. Liso, please. Thank you, Janet. Um, good to see everybody here. Welcome. Um, it's a great honor and delight to uh, have this meeting come together. Um, and a big shout out to Zafa Mudlu, who's concept this was and whose uh, energy brought us all together. Um, I uh, just have a few slides that I want to step through that address what we at the University of Arizona and in the state of um, Arizona are doing um, when it comes to addressing the challenges and opportunities that we see in the semiconductor workforce development um, sector. Um, I will say that um, in my own background, my um, degrees are all in physics, uh, but I um, went from, um, as a relatively early career, person went to uh, went and worked in Silicon Valley for uh, 16 years before coming back to the academy so I have seen both sides of um, of uh, uh, being in the semiconductor sector the industry and the academic side I guess not the government side um, uh, and I'm hoping that we can have a spirited discussion about what do we need to do as a nation to meet the needs for um, the semiconductor sector because there are both enormous challenges and opportunities ahead of us as I see it. So, um, without further ado, um, uh, here at the University of Arizona, we launched a Center for Semiconductor Manufacturing with three goals. The first of these is to partner as widely as we can to develop comprehensive curriculum offerings, which is a recognition that over the past 15 to 20 years, we've disinvested in educating people specifically about semiconductor technology, which was a reflection of a disinvestment uh, by industry in uh, having manufacturing operations onshore. Uh, and of course, um, I speak as a member of the Faculty of Engineering, there's also been disinvestment at the federal level in R&D in this space, which has meant that faculty have have focused on other things largely. Um, we want to absolutely be um, pre performing R&D to address commercial and national security needs, um, and importantly, to provide a single point of contact for industry partners needing the support of the university um, as they go about their uh, efforts. So that's um, the center. I want to then zero in on the workforce development part of that. As I said, we're really uh, keen to make sure that we're not reinventing any wheels. We want to make sure that we're partnering um, across the state of Arizona to develop curriculum and deliver it in ways that are uh, modern, flexible, and adaptable, and meet the workforce needs where they are, meet people where they're at in terms of um, educational needs. So our objectives are to cover the waterfront. We want to have expanded access to technical training and education at all levels, spanning uh, high school, community colleges, universities, current workforce upskilling, and continuing education groups. And then we also need to recruit K through 12 students into semiconductor related studies with engaging and interactive content. To that end, we have under development two major um, uh, infrastructure components. One is a digital content for a digital content sharing platform that will allow instructors and faculty um, at our partner institutions to freely swap and use curriculum that's developed at different institutions. And that content will come in very modular pieces. It might be a short snippet of video. It might be a full lecture. It might be all kinds of different um, sort of modes and modalities. But what we want is to serve it up in a way that's highly searchable so that people at any institution can drop into the platform and say, I need something that explains this physical phenomenon or that process. Um, and have the different institutions be able to add content to it so that it builds and grows over time and gets refined over time. And I'm happy to talk about that in detail. Um, the other thing that we're doing is building an AR VR training uh, platform, which we call Semi Experience, that will serve up 
um, augmented reality training in the same way. Um, we have support for this effort from the Arizona Commerce Authority, and I want to give a, a special shout out to Pima Community College and Greg Wilson, who's uh, here with us on the uh, panel today, is going to talk particularly about Pima's role in this. Um, a, another partner of ours, Central Arizona College, has been really important to us in this. Unfortunately, they couldn't be here today. Chandler Unified School District um, is uh, an incredibly important partner to us as well. Um, and we're working with them to build what we think will be the nation's first career and technical education program, a two-year high school program in semiconductor manufacturing. So that's a lot of, um, lot of fun things going on there. Um, so um, here's just sort of a laundry list of all the things that we've got underway now. I just mentioned the two-year uh, program, the CTE program. Unfortunately, that won't launch until fall 2025, but that's because of the pace at which state departments of education roll, which is not fast. Um, <laughs> so we have approval to develop this program, but it can't launch until fall 2025. Um, on the undergraduate um, side, we are developing a fast track in semiconductor manufacturing, which is a, a phrase that we use internally, to mean a co-curricular program with about 20 hours of content that has a digital badge and a certificate with it, but carries no prerequisites so that any student can come into the program and get a taste and an understanding of what semiconductor manufacturing is. Um, then we have an undergraduate certificate in semiconductor manufacturing um, coming online in fall 2024, a minor in semiconductor manufacturing. At the graduate level, we're bringing online three, uh, st initially three grad stackable graduate certificates that lead to a master's degree. Um, we can add more certificates into that structure, which is good, so that people can pick their own adventure and still end up with a master's degree. And we have an accelerated master's program um, which will be able to take in uh, undergraduates from across the um, engineering disciplines, physics and chemistry, um, put them through an accelerated program so that they end up with an undergraduate degree and a master's degree in a five-year period. Um, and importantly, I um, mentioned this uh, earlier, but the text on the right speaks to the fact that all of this content is going to be served up and shared with our partners. Um, on a, a digital platform which is called Frost, which is the brand name, um, so that we are not trying to reinvent each other's curriculum. We're trying to do this efficiently and effectively um, and allow for it to be refined over time in a really um, efficient way as well. Um, and then I want to give um, a shout out to some of my colleagues who are here in the audience who have put together this concept of this semi-experience uh, platform, which is a similar idea but serving up augmented reality content. Um, our goal and aspiration is that we will be able to incorporate company provided content as well as university created content in a platform that allows students to have a digitally immersive experience in semiconductor uh, manufacturing environments and with semiconductor manufacturing related tooling. Uh, without them needing to be physically near a clean room facility. This will be a really important part of trying to bring people into the fold and, and develop an interest in the semiconductor sector, no matter where they live, including in our vast state of Arizona, people who live on Native American reservations and in very remote and rural towns. So this is a really important part, we believe, of building a much more inclusive workforce. Hand over the um, podium to Elizabeth Green, who I'm delighted to introduce to you. She's the Global Senior Director for Organizational Learning and Development at LAM Research. Elizabeth, thank you. I'm going to put the magic device there in case you want to use thank it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's nice to be here today. I was introducing myself to a couple people in the audience saying, I'm the Senior Director of Global Learning and Development at LAM Research. And a couple of people said, oh, you're in HR. Yes, I'm in HR, human resources. So my background is a little bit different than a lot of the individuals here today. Uh, my group specifically focuses on leadership development, professional development, career pathways, and learning technology and systems. And about a year ago, I was handed our technical ladder program to be incorporated into our career pathways infrastructure. 
So I have some slides, just one quick one about LAM Research, if you haven't heard of us before. So we're the global leader in wafer fabrication equipment, been around since 1980. So a little snapshot of the organization that I work for and how we're quickly growing globally. And I think I might have seen a slide sim similar to this in the deck. <laughs> so I won't cover. I'll quickly go through this, and I know there's a lot of robust conversations to be had in the panel format in just a little bit, but we are getting ready to be part of this trillion-dollar semiconductor sector, and in doing so, we realize that the impact on the amount of skilled employees that we need to have in our organization is really strong. So we are about 20,000 employees now, and we're preparing to be about 30,000, to have about 30,000 employees by the year 2030. And we realize that there's not enough skilled talent to fill the critical roles that we have within the organization. We do know that we need to invest in our future. So we have some critical things that we're doing to invest in our future growth. And I will say that one is research with university faculty and industry. So we have robust partnerships across several universities. And then of course, R&D is one of our main focal points over the next several years. And then we're growing our manufacturing footprint to be closer to our customers, investing heavily in those areas. But as we grow, we have a critical need to fill all of these roles that you can see on the slide here. So several opportunities for skilled talent to come into our organization. That being said, I own Global Learning and Development, but workforce development is a cross-departmental approach. So when you think about attracting and recruiting, that's on our talent acquisition and what they're doing and partnering with universities to get talent in and interested in coming to us. And then engaging and empowering is also part of my responsibility and we have a team called University Engagements and they focus on empowering and engaging as well. And then developing and retaining is also what we're doing and making sure we have career pathways and upskilling and reskilling opportunities for our existing workforce. So I'll just show a couple quick slides on how we connect. A big focus for our talent acquisition team is connecting with and sharing career opportunities through research collaborations, academia, academic consortia, fellowships, and internships. We focus heavily in this area on recruitment marketing, making sure that we're getting people interested in what we have to offer. And you can see here that 54% of U.S. college graduates hired in 2022 were from universities receiving LAM research funding. We also want to make sure learning isn't just education, formal education, but also we have learning experiences. So we have robust internships, which I know everyone has internships, and then we have apprenticeships, particularly highlighting what we have at our site in Tualatin, Oregon. We also partner with local community colleges to co-build curriculum. Then they come in, and this is more of the assembly to test technician experience, and they work with a senior technician to do on-the-job training, kind of like a buddy program. We also sponsor high school students who are from a variety of different types of schools and they come in and we call it the I can see you, I can be you program where they're coming into our Fremont campus and taking a look at what it's like to be an engineer for a day. Um, and then we also, as others will talk about, we are heavily invested in virtual reality training tools and on our tools and equipment. So that's part of the experiential learning that we have and then we are piloting a program for our Semiverse solutions. This is something that is making sure that we're lowering that barrier to access, again, in sort of the Semiverse space around training. And then the university engagements and channels, I spoke a little bit about this. I will speed through some of what we're doing here. I heard someone at lunch talking about the Grace Hopper Conference, so I will notate here some of the engagements that we have um, partnerships that we have and making sure that we can close that gap with a skilled workforce with diverse representation. So we're part of the GEM National Conference and National Consortium, the Grace Hopper Conference. We also give scholarships through the United Negro College Fund. And then this is what we focus on career pathways for different types of engineering classifications throughout LAM. This is the one that I acquired about 
a year ago, really focusing on reskilling and upskilling within the LAM community across these 14 different disciplines that we have. And I want to say, if you even pluck this out of the engineering space, we do career pathing across LAM as well. So it's something that we just holistically believe in. And we've created this system of knowledge sharing. So you take your subject matter experts across LAM and you put them in positions of content writers, advisors, coaches and mentors, and instructors. And this makes sure that we're providing, so there's sort of a broad knowledge that we give all of our engineers. So there's an onboarding program aspect to it. And then there's focused curriculum based on your particular engineering discipline. Through this program, we were able to see higher levels of promotion at 2.5%, higher levels of retention at 5% above the LAM average, higher levels of internal mobility, and then higher levels of performance. We also have partnerships with San Jose State University in co-building curriculum for a Master's of Systems Engineering program, and then we also partner with UC Berkeley for a program more on senior managers and director levels. But this is a pathway, so if you think about our traditional concept of ladders and you're just going up in level, you wanna make sure that those mobility opportunities, the skills and capability frameworks that we develop in this program are things that you can take into other roles to help you chart out a path that is more diverse than just the typical trajectory that you would think about. And lastly, to close, uh, what we want to do now is to make sure that we're scaling our career pathways through a through technology. So we're looking at an internal talent marketplace. How can we capture the skills and capabilities of those within LAM and have a line of sight for them for opportunities that they can, you know, create a career aspiration for? We fill that gap with education, exposure, and experience. And always keeping a line of sight on being competitive as far as our pay, benefits, and total awards packages. And then we really want to amplify our community college and university partnerships to continue to co-build curriculum and offer those on-the-job experiences. Thank you very much. So, well, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Greg Wilson to the podium, who's the Dean of Applied Technology right here in Tucson at Pima Community College, which is about, I think it's like a seven minute drive away. <laughs> uh, so we work extremely closely with Pima Community College. Um, it is our biggest transfer pipeway for students coming uh, into engineering here at the University of Arizona. But just as importantly, many of our students go down the road to Pima to use their extraordinary fabrication facilities when they're working on their senior design projects. So it's a really tight partnership that works to uh, benefit the community uh, really richly. So um, I've worked with Greg on many things over the years and it's a delight to have him um, in the community pulling forward with us on the challenges to provide enough talented people to the semiconductor sector today. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Liesl, and Zafir, thank you for the invitation to be here today. Uh, yes, seven minutes or exactly 1.9 miles, but you know, timing is everything, right? Uh, so I wanted to share a little bit about what is happening uh, west on Speedway. Uh, again, I'm Dean of Applied Technology, which for Pima is one of our 10 academic divisions. Um, and as we're focused on workforce development, uh, just wanted to share that we also have a workforce development team that is a horizontal that works with every group uh, across the district. And for the last several years, really going back to, uh, it really started with our previous chancellor, Dr. Lee Lambert, when he joined us in 2013. Uh, and then we got a little bit specific uh, in 2017 when we dedicated a, just under $100 million to the first of several centers of excellence. And this is coming out of work that we've done over the years with the Lumina Foundation, right? Anyone can build a, build a building and then slap a center of excellence label on it. Uh, but this uh, graph gives you an idea of the, the types of things that go into that uh, in terms of standardizing how you work with industry, how you work with your educational partners, and the type of curriculum that you're building. So as has been mentioned previously, we really are what we see as a partner from our middle school and high schools, uh, the K-12 systems. Just to give you an idea, we 
currently have dual enrollment partnerships with several districts in southern Arizona, and that's about 6,000 students that we serve uh, every year. Um, so either dual enrollment or concurrent enrollment uh, for programs like aviation where uh, we have a huge uh, center down by the airport and the high schools don't have that, so they just send them directly to us. Uh, multiple on-ramps and off-ramps, as was mentioned before. Uh, so yes, we will serve that high school population coming into us through dual enrollment, so they don't have to start from scratch. But we also do a lot of upskilling and reskilling. So again, partnering with our workforce unit where we are able to hire faculty from industry to uh, raise this, the uh, performance levels of those already in the industry. Case in point, one of our newer developments has been around optics. Uh, we are serving optics technicians in the first class we ran uh, this past fall. We had an industry person and all of the students in the class were already employees of local optics firms, but they didn't have a, a lot of background in it. And so we ran a 10 week class that really just uh, helped upskill so they were able to perform at a higher level. Uh, I'll mention the facilities a little bit. Um, so yeah, two miles that way, we have created the first of several centers of excellence, uh, again, Total just under $100 million. It's a three story, 100,000, 130,000 square foot advanced manufacturing building. And I know several of the folks are coming to take a tour. If you'd like to be part of that group, just let us know. But we are all about hands on. Um, it, we do quite a bit of theory, but students do not get through our programs without actually performing the tasks. Uh, and then applied technology, our area is the first of several centers of excellence. If you have not seen our cybersecurity um, live cyber warfare range that it's, that's at the East Campus, I highly recommend you do that. Uh, the dean always likes to share that students were actually finding or fighting off hacks that the FBI actually wasn't aware of, so they actually were able to send a note um, because, again, these are industry folks that are helping our students, so they found something and were able to, to pass that along. So we try to make everything we do uh, mimic what is happening in industry, and that's because of the industry partners that we have. And you can see the rest of the uh, centers of excellence that are currently in the works. Uh, just to give you an idea of numbers, uh, you know, for community colleges across the country, numbers have been equal or down for the last several years. Uh, again, we have invested quite a bit in the applied technology, and Pima is actually doing pretty good this year. We're up 5%, but on the technical side, we're actually up 23. Uh, and that's not even fully realizing what, uh, we haven't really even fully realized uh, we've got waiting lists, and we're still kind of opening up the space, right? So the building opened, you can see the ribbon cutting, that was uh, May 5th, actually, and we first started serving students uh, in August. Uh, so I mentioned high school partnerships, for example. So if you're familiar with JTED, uh, the local high school system, every year for the last four or five years, they've had 65 to 70 students that they wanted to send to our welding program. And we could only take a handful of those until we opened the building. And so if they have a waiting list, I think the waiting list today is 66. We were able to save 20, serve 28, and by fall we'll be serving all of them and then some. The aviation expansion, uh, we doubled our footprint physically, but then are also serving, went from serving 125 students to 250, and we still have a year's waiting list. So in terms of meeting industry need, uh, it takes a lot of work. Uh, those are some of the other areas. Um, really just want to focus more on the semiconductors and really highlight some of the things that we're doing to attract students into the pipelines. That picture there is actually, uh, if you're familiar with NC3, the National Coalition of Certification Centers, uh, they run what they call signing day. So if you're familiar with the high school athlete who puts on the hat to go play at Arizona or Alabama, uh, we do the same thing for students that are deciding to take uh, a technical pathway. Have their parents, um, that doesn't even really show the full crowd. We actually had about seven to 800 guests, including industry parents and students so we serve everybody, nursing students, the te technical students, because we really want to let them know that the industry and the community is behind them. Uh, the other thing, you know, one time, uh, one of the things that, one of the knocks, I should say, that typically comes to community colleges is that we're preparing students to be entry-level technicians for somebody else, right, so that they can 
earn money for somebody else. Well, in our new advanced manufacturing building, and that's a picture of it, uh, on the top floor, we've actually got a business incubator. And on the bottom floor, we have an idea lab. So we are leasing space to uh, those entrepreneurs that are right before the accelerator stage. And they are mixing with our students. And so giving students the idea, I, I forgot the phrase, right? But if you see it, you can be it. Um, and so we want our students engaged and having that entrepreneurial mindset. So we are integrating those competencies into our technical programs. Um, so, and basically that's a three-story makerspace, right? So if the entrepreneur wants to prototype something, they would go to the first floor. Again, students are interacting in that space uh, and they can see how that's done. We also have a, uh, I'll tell this one story, Caterpillar, when they moved their surface mining division from the Midwest to Tucson several years ago, they called Pima and said, hey, can you, can you help train our engineers in machining, welding, and prototyping? And so our faculty met with their engineers, had them design a small vehicle that would tow a load, um, you know, because you want the engineer to understand the final product, right? You can design whatever you want. Doesn't mean the technician can get behind the $75,000 tire. It went really, really well, right? We ran several cohorts, but we could only do it on Fridays when our labs were empty. And so this building on the second floor has a 10,000 square foot flexible industry training lab. We've got a 10 ton bridge crane, loads equipment in, put it into that 10,000 square foot space, train Caterpillar, train Raytheon, train Sergeant, take it away, bring in the next thing, and we just keep revolving. And again, the student lounge is right next to that, so students are being exposed to that nonstop, you know, how do you stay current with industry. Uh, virtual living learning labs, that's something else that we do. So being able to feed students live data so they can make live decisions. Um, one of the examples of that is uh, we have an energy partnership with Train, for example. And so students who are doing building automation systems are able to see that uh, and then make decisions. Again, trying to imitate industry as best we can. Uh, industry for certifications. Uh, this is a picture of the optics group, so all industry members helping us build our curriculum, uh, and we're about to do the exact same thing for semiconductors, so. Mm -hmm. eh, I'll just show off. That's a picture of our brand new aviation hangar with the brand new jet um, that was donated, so. Yeah, you're yeah. <laughs> thank you. There we go, I did it. Uh, Patricia Simmons is the Associate Pro Program Director for the Division of Engineering Education and Centers, the EEC, as we fondly know it, um, at the National Science oh. Foundation. Thank you, Patricia. Okay, thank you. And thank you again for the kind invitation to join you today. I always am delighted to do that. And I'm also shameless about recruiting future reviewers. If you'd be interested in reviewing for us, please let me know. We are always anxious to work with new folks uh, and value your input in this process. Well, one of the things, let me make sure I get on the right button here. Yes, um, I prepare too many slides. And so some of these I'm gonna go through very quickly because you can read them at your leisure. And I am delighted to discuss them with you in great detail at any time. And I've put my contact information in there. We've heard already from our previous speakers today about the workforce needs, um, the CHIPS Act, what's going on here. We do require and need a, an increase in the workforce for the next several uh, decades. So where does that leave us at NSF? Okay, when we look at that, we can see, and again, here's some very nice charts for you to use in your proposals as you prepare them for submission. Um, <laughs> Just a little hint there, uh, to look at what's really going on and what can we be doing. You know, where are we now and what do we need to be concerned about from that point of uh, degree. And again, previous speakers have talked about the needs certainly in electrical engineering and the fact that that's trending down, not up in number of degrees. And we have, of course, the data to show that. Um, and that's of great concern to all of us uh, if we're going to maintain and increase the workforce, especially in the semiconductor industry. So where does that leave us now? Well, let's look at what we currently know about DEI and what's happening. So if we look at diversity and we look at race, race and ethnicity, we can see these are the percentages for uh, students with Hispanic backgrounds and also African Americans, black uh, coming into electrical engineering. That's what's happening at the different levels as they're completing their degrees. 
if we look at women, coming up next here, here we go. We look at gender, this is what we see about women and bachelor's degrees in this area. Okay, and in particular, we can see what is occurring here. So that's not acceptable, and I've heard that said by many people at this meeting as well. So what can we do about that? What is it that we need to be aware of in terms of the cyclical nature of an industry as well? So what can we do to attract more students? We've heard some really good ideas so far. You're doing some fabulous things at various institutions, which is moving the needle. But again, we need to look also at the national level. What can we do? Um, again, salary is not sufficient in and of itself. We've heard when the previous speakers mentioned that. So what is it that we can do to increase what's going on here? Okay. What do students really want in a career? Okay. And if we look at a Wordle, this is what has popped out in terms of that. Change the world is really the core concept. Now, we know that because we probably believe the same thing. Okay, so that's wonderful. Money is certainly very important because you need to be able to sustain a lifestyle, to have a family, to have a good career and enjoy that. Um, job security, so other things are, other variables are also very important to people. So what can, what does this mean for what we do? Okay. Use the arrow keys okay. On, the, um, on the computer? Okay, thank you. Yes, I think you are absolutely right. Okay, so, all right, here we go. Up doesn't necessarily mean forward. No. Okay. okay, there we go. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so here are some things about semiconductors. Where do semiconductors fit in this world? We have a number of issues that we need to deal with. Um, there are many options for majors in this area. We can look at communications, energy, vehicles, health, and certainly IOT. So another issue is, as you have mentioned, semiconductor education is very expensive. You need a clean room, you need facilities. That does not come cheaply. Okay. Another issue, we have curriculum challenges as well on that. So what do we do, as you have mentioned? We really did not talk before this as we planned out our PowerPoint presentations. So we need to be aware of a number of these different parameters as we're looking to what we can do to move the needle in the industry. And um, again, I'm gonna skip through a lot of these because you can read those at your leisure. But we are looking at what is it that we can take away from this background information as we're moving forward that's gonna be important. And more specifically, what can NSF engineering programs do to help you move that needle forward? So one of those that I really want to highlight with you is providing undergraduate research experiences and mentoring and uh, community building capacity at that level. I work in the workforce development cluster there, and that is one of our goals, is to really enhance what is going on in that sector as best we can. We have a number of programs. I'm happy to talk in more detail with you about them. Some of them involve curriculum. So there's no need to reinvent wheels because we have some national curricula already going uh, in engineering and I'm happy to put you in touch with people. That's one of the reasons we come to these meetings is so that we also help you network where you need to do. These programs range from elementary level all the way through to community college. Um, Specifically, the program I'm currently working on very heavily is the REU program. And for those of you who don't know, NSF offers a Research Experiences for Undergraduates program. Engineering has the largest number of projects in this area for uh, the entire NSF. So typically, students will come in, do an eight to 10 week research experience in an active research lab. 
Typically, the um, PIs will try to recruit those individuals who come from research, uh, not research strong institutions, along with uh, certain demographics and backgrounds to try to increase the uh, and broaden the participation of people in this area. This is just a quick map. We have over 165 sites right now. I would love to increase that. That's a hint um, <laughs> for you. Um, and really see what we can do even further at the national level. We have another program. Not only do we focus on undergraduate students, but we also focus on teachers. Because as we know, teachers can make a critical difference. And when I say teachers, I'm talking about the pre-K all the way through community college level. Okay, that we have a special program called Research Experiences for Teachers. And again, it's very similar to the REU program for undergraduates, but it is focused on educators specifically. And again, we have some 45 plus sites and we really work very hard with the teachers and the PIs to make sure that they understand what it, the nature of research and engineering is all about and how they can very importantly translate those experiences into meaningful activities and exp learning experiences for their students, no matter what the level. We also have a veterans program. Just throwing that out there for some future ideas that you might have. And then I'm very pleased to talk about the new partnership that we have on the RU program now. And you heard actually one of the former RU students speak about that, Todd. So his experience back in his undergraduate days, he had the opportunity to participate in an REU. We, last year we put a partnership together with the uh, Semiconductor Research Corporation and it's a very active and viable partnership. We're very pleased about being a partner with them to help sponsor some of these REU programs. And specifically, we had six programs, uh, projects last year that we were able to fund together. And again, these are all public knowledge, so I would encourage you to log in, contact the PIs on this, and see what they were doing that really merits uh, the support of both NSF and the Semiconductor Research Corporation. And with that, I will pause because part of this is to get to know you and talk, and I can't wait for your questions. So thank you very much for your kind attention. You can tell it's not my computer. Oh, no, wait a minute. There we go. And now I'm going to, um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Eric Hadland, Director for Technology Policy at BSIA, the Semiconductor Industry Association. And I just want to give a shout out to the SIA because nobody has produced more beautiful graphics that have been sh than have been shown here today to show us where all of our problems lie as a nation um, than SIA. So um, thank you for demonstrating exceptional communication talents, Eric. <laughs> you can pass our thanks back to your team. <laughs> Over to you. I'm so glad that this report is getting uh, some utility and uh, you folks are finding it uh, beneficial to the things that you work on. Um, like Lisa mentioned, Eric Hadland with Semiconductor Industry Association. It's my pleasure to be here with you all today. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, who SIA is uh, and how we're thinking about this uh, problem of workforce development and uh, the needs that we need to reconcile with in the, ne in the coming years. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the Semiconductor Industry Association is the voice of the U.S. Semiconductor in Washington, D.C. Semiconductor Industry in Washington, D.C. Uh, we represent about 99% of the semiconductor industry by revenue uh, domestically and about two-thirds of non-U.S. chip firms. Um, I'll leave it to you to figure out the third that we do not represent. Uh, but uh, we, we really seek to present uh, aggregated uh, industry insights to lawmakers and to the executive branch so that they have the information they need to put together policies and funding programs that will be most activating to the industry. Uh, we want to advance policies that help the industry grow. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that industry growth in the coming minutes. Uh, we also want to uh, 
unite the industry around common challenges? What are policies that will fuel innovation, uh, even if it's innovation that's far into the future? Uh, we want to make sure that we're being attentive to our basic science programs. Uh, we also want to propel business. Uh, not all problems that the industry faces are technology problems and science problems. We have economic problems and business problems and supply chain problems. And we need to be engaging those with our lawmakers also. Uh, finally, we need to drive inter uh, international competition. Our companies and our innovation are some of the best in the world, and we have product solutions that will be beneficial well beyond our own borders. Semiconductors create jobs. Uh, currently, we have about 345,000 semiconductor jobs in the United States. Uh, just over 200,000 of those come from de uh, device manufacturing sector. Uh, we also have machinery manufacturing, those who make the tools that populate uh, the most expensive square footage of construction, which is clean room space. Uh, and then also about $100,000, uh, or sorry, 100,000 design jobs as well. Uh, for fabulous design firms, U.S. has immense strength in this part of the industry as well. And then 9,000 uh, to round out the uh, final uh, portion there for the EDA providers, those who are making the software that's allowing the design community to do their jobs very well. But we are not only creating 345,000 jobs in the United States directly in the semiconductor industry. There's about a 5.7 multiplier for jobs in the industry uh, that benefit from uh, the products that we make, uh, comprise our sub-suppliers, uh, those who are doing uh, materials providing to us, as well as uh, construction jobs, etc. When you multiply all of that out, that's about 2 million jobs. So there, are, there is a very significant fraction of the U.S. economy that is dependent on our industry. And we're growing. Uh, as was mentioned uh, earlier, and thank you very much, I'm glad this is, uh, I'm glad this is making its way out again, uh, you, the uh, SIA and WSTS, which is a body that we work with, uh, has forecasted out to the end of the decade that uh, while we are currently sitting right at about $575 billion in annual revenue, that's going to grow significantly by the end of the decade. Uh, we forecast out to a trillion dollars. Growth in our industry tends to come from new use cases. We are not just putting semiconductors in computers and smartphones anymore. Uh, we find new use cases for this all the time. Todd mentioned the sensors that are creating enormous volumes of data. AI, generative AI, is an enormous demand driver for our industry that we forecast is going to uh, add significantly to uh, helping us close that gap to a trillion dollars. Electrification, electric vehicles, uh, the charging infrastructure that goes along with all of that, and autonomous driving. Um, these are all demand drivers that are going to usher us into that uh, $1 trillion uh, annual revenue. A lot has been said about the uh, workforce development problem already, and I, don't need to, um, and I don't need to convince anyone in this room that it's something we need to be paying attention to. Uh, but this is not an amorphous boogeyman that we don't know. We have numbers to go with this. SIA uh, commissioned a report with Oxford Economics uh, to understand what kind of gaps are we talking about? What levels of education? What majors? What disciplines? Uh, we published this report last summer, Chipping Away, and it's really aimed at quantifying uh, the gaps that we're seeing so that we have a target to aim at and a benchmark that we can measure ourselves against with new interventions that come online. One of the main findings of this report is that we are not unique. This is a problem that faces the tech sector in the US broadly. Uh, there are actually about 3.85 million job openings created by the end of the decade, and uh, semiconductors are only a small piece of that. Uh, so we have, some company here, we have some company here in this problem, and a lot of people who are aiming at, uh, aiming at uh, moving the needle on this in some pretty monumental ways. But within the semiconductor industry, we are forecasting that there is just about 115,000 new jobs that will be added by the end of the decade. And under current graduation rates and business as usual, we face potential to uh, allow 67,000 of those to go unfilled. Um, I like to point out right off the bat that this number was calculated under a business as usual scenario, and we are not in a business as usual scenario. There are new, pro uh, new programs that, get that are getting introduced, programs that are still uh, being planned that will come online, and they will move the needle on this 67,000 job shortfall. How much? I don't know yet. It's important for us to refresh this analysis on a regular cadence so that we know where our efforts are being effective and where we really need to double down 
siphon more resources into it, work a little bit harder uh, to close that gap by the end of the decade. Um, also, we turned out uh, some analysis that showed that this is really a diverse problem. This isn't only PhD engineers that we need. This isn't only technicians that we need. Uh, we need computer scientists, engineers at all levels of education, and of course, a very significant fraction of technicians as well. Um, this growth is coming primarily from two, uh, two drivers. Number one, the growth in the industry. When you go from 575 billion to a trillion dollars, that's gonna create a lot of jobs. Additionally, the United States, through the CHIPS Act, is bringing $230 plus billion of new investment online in the United States. That will also create new jobs as well. Uh, so this is really an aggregate of those two drivers. So what do we do with all of this? What are the recommendations here? First off, we have to focus on regional partnerships and programs for growing our pipeline for skilled technicians. Um, these are jobs that are needed in certain parts of the country and in certain parts of the country where the semiconductor industry is not, that's not a good use of our resources to be focusing on uh, growth in those, in, in those areas, particularly at the technician level. Technicians tend to stay closer uh, to where they receive their education than say a PhD engineer who's willing to go almost anywhere and uh, we need our programs to actually reflect that. Uh, let's see here. Second recommendation is that we need to be growing the STEM pipeline for, energy, uh, for engineers and computer scientists vital to our industry and other sectors as well. Uh, so like I mentioned, this is really a STEM problem and part of that is we need to just get more and more students to choose careers in STEM and to help them be successful in STEM. Uh, student, there, there's a little bit of a disturbing statistic that uh, a lot of students get into uh, a chemistry major, a physics major, an engineering major, computer science, doubly, whatever it is, and those classes are really hard and they're not able to be successful in those classes and so uh, we end up losing a lot of them. It's uh, really unfortunate that this has come to be thought of as uh, there are weeder classes out there. I have yet to meet a single professor who's looking to end the year with fewer students than they started with. Uh, we need to help our students be successful because this content actually is quite difficult. Recommendation number three, and I would be criminally negligent in my job to not uh, say this, we need to retain and attract more international advanced degree holders uh, uh, to work within the U.S. economy and make it possible for them to be here in more of a durable, long, uh, long-standing way. Unfortunately, the immigration issue has become quite politicized, and there are some obvious solutions to this uh, that are very broadly held, uh, but there's politics involved and we need to really work on peeling that back so we can do the things that are gonna make sense for uh, getting the best workers in the world to want to come to the United States and make that possible. Uh, so with that, I'll thank you. Looking, I'm looking forward to a discussion and uh, pass it back to Liesl. Thank you. I wanna play a game now with my contestants up here. Um, I wanna do a quick lightning round and ask them to give me, I don't know, one word or a phrase that you would um, give in response to students who say the very things that Eric just articulated so well. Um, it's too cyclic and too unstable. Eric, go. Sorry, the question. How do you convince students to come to a field that they view as being cyclic and unstable? I think we need to do a well, first off, the semiconductor. Oh, you, get, you get a phrase. Come on, man. I'm not looking for an essay. <laughs> okay. um, you are already you interested in what we do. How am I interested? Come on, give me more than that. Semiconductors are everywhere. Um, these are in energy technologies. These are in medical technologies. And they're oftentimes the enabling technology for those industries, and yet we're invisible. We need to do a better job of making connections to the things students are already interested in and showing them how we participate. <laughs> You're precious. <laughs> All right, so your, your synopsis there is we've got to make it more clear that semiconductors are embedded in all the things that they love and that they can get involved in a myriad of different sectors across the whole value chain. Is that yes. fair? Very good. Patricia, you got anything better than that? Yes. Be the future. Oh, be the future. Mm, inspire them. I love it. I love it. That's a good one. Greg. Uh, we always share with students that oh. this is a special pathway. For special ed? No. Oh, no. <laughs> Meaning, you've got to be special to take this pathway. 
Okay. There's an exclusivity to it that. Oh, join the special club. Exactly. I like it. I like it. Oh, we've lost microphones. I think there's, there's a switch on top. Oh, there's a switch. Oh, we didn't know that one. Oh, okay. I'll look at that. Um, I would say the concern that I'm hearing is people not wanting to join because, wow, there might be layoffs. I might right. lose, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say as LAM Research, we could mm -hmm. say something like, you invest in us and we'll invest in you. Mm -hmm. So upskilling and reskilling transferable skills that they can take to other organizations or other interests, mm -hmm. that might I like help. It. Okay. Yeah. Is that I a like good it. one? I think transferable skills is important yeah. here, right? To convince students that as we're training them, we're training them to do a myriad of things, not yeah one job in one organization. Which leads me to my next challenge question for my contestants. Apprenticeships. Good, bad, gonna solve the national problem? Greg Very upset. good. Very good. Uh, Pima so, was the first community college in the state of Arizona to go through the process to be okay, recognized. <laughs> <laughs> to be recognized as a federal sponsor of apprenticeships. So, yeah. you know, in our partnerships with workforce, hey, if we can walk into the room and say, we'll take care of the paperwork, we just need the partnership. And if you right. can provide the pathway and step up the salaries over the progression, very good. Very good. And can I give you, can you give me a number? Like how many apprentices are you pushing through? Uh, I don't know that off the top of my head, but I can share, I mean, yeah. machining, automotive, building and construction, uh, automation and robotics. So welding. hundreds? 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 I th well, we just went through this federal okay. process, so, so might be getting close to that. Okay. But it's, the team is growing. Hmm. So Listen. we believe in it. I mean, we're piloting it in our Tualatin, hmm. Oregon location. Hmm. As we're building out that facility, we need people now. So we have, we feel like it's a viable option to get entry level talent in by partnering with the community college, giving, hmm. in co writing the curriculum and creating an opportunity for them to partner right away, six months hmm. with someone in a site who you're walking through the processes. Mm -hmm. And then from what I'm hearing from the site, it's about six months after that for them to be productive. Mm -hmm. So it does seem to be working in our mm -hmm. case Thank study. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody else want to comment on apprenticeships, Eric? Apprenticeships are great because we need multiple modes of learning for the volume of workers that we're looking at. Uh, mm -hmm. Some students will respond very well to that paradigm, and it's a good way to get a student who in the door who might otherwise have been excluded. And uh, so this is a great tool for us to add to our toolbox. Mm. So um, summarizing the things that you brought together and, and um, you know, reflecting on Eric's data, we have two really big problems. One is the volume of people that we need to come to the sector and get interested in it, interested enough to even walk in the door and ask, could I get a job? But the other one is we're in competition with a whole pile of other sectors, all of whom want all my engineers, for example. What is it you would say to students that is compelling about why semiconductors rather than clean energy or any of the other engineering disciplines in particular that want the same people and the same talent? I was going to mention something in my talk that I forgot to. Uh, mm -hmm. You're right, we're in competition with the rest of uh, you know, the tech sector mm -hmm. for workers. Um, in fact, there are already a lot of tech workers out there and a lot of tech workers being trained. Part of our strategy has to be stealing. Oh, stealing. <laughs> stealing. Um, we need to get a bigger fraction of the graduates who are coming out every year into this industry. Um, Semiconductors are exciting. We are enabling the AI world. Uh, there are software developments that are certainly um, enabling this as well, but this is a hardware limited problem. And so uh, one of the things we hear about from students is, oh my gosh, AI is great and I really want to go into AI. Fantastic. Make the hardware that can make it possible. Uh, but really, again, focusing on those connections to the things that they care about and showing how our sector is going to enable those for decades mm. to come. Mm. Excellent. Any other comment there? I'll turn to the audience. Very good. Questions, comments, thoughts? Mike. Mike needs a mic. Ah, Mike. Or, or. Thank you. <laughs> ah. um, 
This is a, a great topic. I appreciate everyone's thoughts on it. There's a uh, factor that, a challenge, I would say, that hasn't really been discussed. Um, and, and so, so over the four decades of my academic and professional career, I've watched the state funding for universities decrease steadily, dramatically over the years, over the decades. Um, I remember uh, uh, universities in Illinois went like two years without funding because the legislature couldn't get their act together. Mm -hmm. but, um, but the point is it's made it more and more expensive for people to go to college. So my question for, for any of you all is, is, is there a campaign to lobby state legislatures to say this amount of funding in state universities brings this amount of economic benefit? Is there, are we paying attention to that uh, stakeholder segment in, in, our, in, our, in our economy, in our, in our uh, educational system? Um, I'm going to take a run at it, but welcome comments from the uh, from the um, panel as well. Yes, uh, there's a lot of effort goes into that messaging and assessing the economic value. Um, I would, um, however, point out that universities rank fourth or fifth on the priority list in every state, where below is the pension fund funded, are the roads intact, are the schools operating K through 12 operating effectively. And usually we fall below potholes as well, infrastructure. So, which is why I say four or five. So there's a little bit of variation there. Um, but I do want to give a shout out to New York State and their STEM scholarships for um, students going to university. So I can't remember the details and maybe somebody here does, but any student who goes into a STEM degree at a state university um, gets 100% of their tuition covered if the family income is less than some number like $120,000 of income for the family. I can't remember the exact number. That was transformative in New York State. That really moved the di dial on people coming to universities to get STEM degrees because they knew that families of modest means could then afford um, to support their students through that. And the students knew that they weren't going to graduate with big debt burdens, because you're right, we have shifted the cost of education from the public tax base to individual families, and it's very painful for individuals and their families. Any comment that anyone wants to make, Greg? You may not be aware of this, but in the state of Arizona, Maricopa and Pima County receive zero aid from the state, and that's zero. been going on for maybe getting close to eight years. Right, so we've come up with different ways. We work, certainly work obviously with industry who contributes to our programs or even local foundations like the Brown Family Foundation here in Tucson contributed 2.5 million to our technical programs uh, a couple years ago. Yeah, we've had to get very creative just to keep the boat afloat. Very good, thanks Mike. Any other comments, questions? Yes, way in the back. I'm gonna ask you to grab that microphone though so that the people that are online can hear. What are your regards for semiconductor and semiconductor adjacent education and grades, uh, kindergarten through middle school? Great question. Panelists. It certainly is a priority. We have several projects currently funded that are addressing that. Um, mostly within the new STEM education directorate at NSF, you will find uh, great interest uh, from them in focusing on that level. Um, as we know from the research, most students make a decision and become aware of careers in the middle school age range. So if you grab them right in that particular age range, chances are very likely you can uh, persuade them or offer them more opportunities to consider STEM degrees or STEM education in their futures. Um, a lot of times students when they get to high school have already decided they're not into STEM or they are. And so there is also a, um, a high school curriculum actually that is currently in place called E for USA. 
Um, it's um, doing a fantastic job. It's literally uh, you know, designated to work with those students in select high schools to get them to seriously pursue um, advanced degrees in engineering. So there are those programs out there. Unfortunately, they're not in every school. You know, and that's, that's really what we're trying to look at as well, is what can we do that will off make those opportunities available to every student in every school. But those are some of the beginnings. And I'm happy to talk with you at greater length about some of those programs as well. Thank you, great question. Yes. Hi, um, super exciting work, especially at Pima Community College. Congratulations. Um, so my question is, what incentives exist in Arizona to um, maybe, maybe tax breaks for companies, you know, to support education at the community college or the higher ed level or even at K-12? Um, I know there are states like New York, you know, that has an extensive community college semiconductor certification system. Um, we're from, I'm from Colorado, um, Christine Levy from Colorado School of Mines. And, you know, I'm looking at your, the wonderful work that you've done at Pima Community College and wondering, oh my gosh, you know, what does it take to get started when some areas have huge gains already, you know, for, for those states that, that maybe are a little bit far, further behind. Do you know of any legislation happening, you know, that would provide companies with tax breaks to share industry professionals as instructors, um, anything like that? Wow, great question, and I don't have good answers. Does anybody know what the, Eric, looks like you. So we, we have heard quite a lot from companies and from community colleges uh, that companies are willing to share curriculum uh, because they know that they have workforce need on the horizon. Mm -hmm. The question is, who do you give it to? And there's uh, a lot of interest in creating this national repository that we've sort of heard about earlier today to put curriculum from those institutions that have developed successful modules into this database that those who are spinning up new activities can use and they're just ready on day one. Uh, so getting that up and off the ground and then teaching uh, instructors how to use that and what information is available, uh, there's immense interest in that. Um, a, another thing to bear in mind is that uh, companies in their CHIPS applications need to speak to workforce development plans so that the government knows that there will be an adequate supply of workers to work in that facility that they're helping to fund. Uh, and that can include uh, many different kinds of contributions. I don't know specifically if it includes uh, uh, employees from a company going and teaching for some you know, eight-week period at um, an institution, but that's a great idea, and I'm gonna remember that when I go home. <laughs> I was just going to add, uh, Pima is part of the Arizona Advanced Technology Network, which was created about seven years ago around advanced manufacturing, specifically automation and robotics uh, for two schools in Maricopa, Pima, and then Central Arizona College right in between us. And we are expanding that across the state to include many more districts and other areas, um, semiconductors being mm -hmm. one of them. And to your question earlier, I wanted to add, uh, Pima also has a Pima for Youth program. Uh, so for kids in elementary school, we set up boot camps or hands-on exposure for students so they can get familiar with equipment. They're like, oh, I, I really like this. Uh, and then we, we continue that through middle school and high school, of course. I'm going to make a very general add-on comment, which is um, uh, state institutions are all not-for-profit entities, which means when companies gift money or uh, tools or um, you know, anything that has you know, clear monetary value, it is a tax deductible gift from <coughs> the company. There is a mountain of paperwork to be done, I will warn you, that <laughs> it does require quite some paperwork to be done. But we do, you know, companies give us gifts all the time um, specifically to fund educational activities that are aligned with whatever their mission is in a sort of a general sense. They can't direct or um, uh, meddle in curriculum development, but they can say, this is the skills that we're looking to come out the other end and then you know, fund the development of those programs generally as a tax deductible um, expense. But I want to say more broadly, 
it will be a disaster and a waste of, of effort if we all end up with different curriculum across the country rather than just sharing materials as broadly as we can. Um, however, there are real barriers to doing that. Every institution has its own administrative and accreditation structure and you've got to work within those boundaries. So you've got to find ways that allow you to share content but still adhere to the accreditation standards and operating models for each of those institutions. So it is not pain free. Uh, when we say curriculum wants to be free, it's sort of free, but there's still a lot, of, a lot of work to be done around the edges to make it operate at any particular institution. Um, I have time for one more quick question. If I could add one more yeah. comment on this. Absolutely, yeah. uh, the National Institute for Innovation Technology, NIIT, has a resource that they've really been focused on building out over the last several years. Uh, even within our industry, we call something something else in a different company or in a different part of the country, and that can make curriculum sharing difficult. Mm -hmm. It can also make finding a job difficult because the job that's called engineering technician over here is called operator over there. Mm -hmm. And so what they've done is they've created this uh, database where you can, a, a prospective student can go in and input the abilities that they have through a standardized inventory they've got and get matched to jobs that are all called different things in different parts of the country, mm -hmm. but it's gonna draw off of that uh, abilities inventory. Good point, excellent point. Good. Any last comment, question?